So I've known Glenn for 25 to 30 years, since the days that he lived in the Valley. And he and I both got involved with Bosnia very early in the middle of that war, and we both became commuters from Logan Airport to Sarajevo quite frequently. So we partnered on that, on that work. And by the time um, Glenn got into Bosnia, he was already a photojournalist and already a graphic designer. And when he lived out here, he designed just about every poster that appeared on any social justice issue that came up. And I noticed I had one on my wall that I was looking at today, and there was Glenn's name. So. He's continued to do that, but then he's grown this social documentary network. And if you haven't, go to the website because it's, it's thorough and intriguing and spectacular. And he does exhibits all over the country and brings other artists together, as he's doing tonight. He curates those exhibits. He also has a magazine called Zeke, which is something I didn't know until I went to the website. That's, that's also quite flourishing. And um, who knows what his imagination and skills are going to call forth next, but it's all in relationship to photography and social justice and transformation. Um, it's really nice to have Glenn back in the Valley, and I thank you, Glenn, for being with us, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Paula. Um, and I want to really thank the Northampton Center for the Arts for hosting tonight's event. This is the first time I've been in this new beautiful facility and it's, it's quite spectacular. The last time I spoke in Northampton was almost 20 years ago after returning from um, a trip to Kosovo uh, shortly after the war ended in 1999. And I gave a slide presentation with actual slides from a Kodak carousel projector, if people remember those, 20 years ago. That was at the first churches here in town. Um, and it showed images and spoke about the aftermath of the war in Kosovo and the efforts to rebuild both infrastructure and people. Tonight's talk is about photography and social justice. What I intend to do over the next 15 minutes is to talk about my own work as a documentary photographer and then an organization and a magazine that I founded, the Social Documentary Network and Zeke magazine. But before I do, I want to start out with two images that have had a profound influence on the course of public opinion and subsequent government policy, just to drive home how important images can be. I think everybody is familiar with this image by photographer Nick Oot of a young Vietnamese girl, Kim Phuc, after being struck by napalm in 1972. And this image um, had a profound effect on public opinion during, during um, the war in Vietnam which by 1972 had already soured. The next image, which has been referred to twice tonight already, is um, by Nalufer Demir, a Turkish photographer of Elan Kurdi. And um, this image had a profound effect on German Prime Minister Angela Merkel and led her to open up the borders of Germany to Syrian refugees, which have had repercussions in a lot of different ways, but it's, it's really this image uh, that um, led her to do that. While each of these images are deserving of an entire discussion, I'm showing them now to emphasize that photographs do matter and can have a profound effect on the course of human events. While living in the Pioneer Valley, in 1993, I co-founded Friends of Bosnia, one of the leading organizations working to end the genocide in Bosnia and later in Kosovo. From 1995 until 2007, I made numerous trips to the former Yugoslavia and ended up producing two traveling photography exhibits, one on the war and recovery efforts in Bosnia and the other one on Kosovo. And these are some images uh, from those two exhibits. The first series of exhibits are from Bosnia, um, taken during and immediately after the war in 1995 and 1996. Uh, many of these images have been shown in exhibitions in Northampton previously. You may have seen these previously. This is an aid um, convoy in central Bosnia, and the box that this woman is holding is a box that we actually packed up at a warehouse here in Springfield, where we collected tons of food, medicine, and clothing and shipped it over to Bosnia. And I was accompanying this convoy both as a humanitarian worker and also as a photographer. The next series of photographs are from Kosovo, both uh, during and immediately after the war, this time in 1999 and 2000.
These images have long stories with them, and um, it would be another, another discussion to go into the history of these images. This is from the last trip I took to the region in 2007. This is in the old quarter of Sarajevo, a beautiful city in a very beautiful country. I use these images in dozens of presentations here in the valley, around New England, and in other parts of the country. I use these images to inform people about genocide in Bosnia and Kosovo, war crimes, and about the effects of war on ordinary people. I spoke about their struggle to survive and rebuild and to advocate for, advocate for a just resolution to the conflict. Each of these projects also eventually became websites. These are created in the very early days of the internet when making a photo gallery on the internet was not such an easy thing to do. And the image on the left is um, from the Bosnia website. On the right is from the Kosovo website. And in 2007, we finally shut down or closed down Friends of Bosnia. And a year later, I founded the Social Documentary Network. Uh, the uh, Social Documentary Network started out as a, um, as a website, which it still is today, uh, although we do much more than just a website. And the fundamental goals was to provide a web platform for documentary photographers to both create online projects and disseminate them to a global audience. What inspired me to start this organization was my own experiences of creating websites of documentary work from the Balkans. I knew there must be thousands of photographers around the world with equally important stories to tell, but didn't have the skills I had to create websites or their projects. Since 2008, when the Social Documentary Network first started, we featured nearly 3,500 documentary projects by more than 2,200 photographers from around the world on very diverse themes. And two of these photographers are here with us tonight to talk about their work, Lou Jones and Matilde Simus. This is the home page of the SDN website right now. If you went here on your mobile device or computer, this is what you would see. In the center part of the website, we feature uh, new projects that have been submitted to the website recently. And you can scroll through and see uh, feature images. And then you could click on any one of these images, and it will take you into um, a gallery uh, about the project. And what's different from the SDN website compared to a lot of other image sharing websites is that photographers need to um, create an entire project. It's not about individual images, it's really about the whole story. So they need to submit a minimum of six images and text about the project and individual photographs. And we could just look at one other project right now. And I encourage you at your leisure just to um, look at the website, you could search for countries, issues, whatever. Uh, th this image is called Dignity in Limbo uh, from Uganda. So that's the SDN website today. And in 2015, we started publishing Zeke, the magazine of global documentary. This is a print and digital publication that allows us to feature the best work from the SDN website but also to present work on themes that are most relevant. And we also work with journalists and writers to write in-depth articles about the themes that we're featuring in the magazine, unlike the website, which relies entirely on the text from the photographers. So I'm just gonna go through some issues of Zeke Magazine. Uh, this is the first one we published in April 2015, and we've been publishing them twice a year ever since. And you could see by the titles of these feature articles the type of work that we focus on. This issue, the um, picture in the center is about um, people living with HIV AIDS and thriving with HIV AIDS. It's called The Positive Community. It's by a photographer who lives here in the Pioneer Valley, John Ray. And I'm just curious, is, is John here tonight? Um, I wasn't sure if he was traveling or, or not, but it's, um, so we, we have worked with quite a few photographers in the valley. This is a special women's issue we did about a year and a half ago. It's all women photographers, all women writers, and we had a guest editor uh, who was a woman to work on this issue. And this is our current issue, uh, just published this past month with four feature articles on youth of Belfast, 
uh, black cowboys in Mississippi, uh, climate change as evidenced by rising tides, and um, teen pregnancy in Rwanda. And um, Zeke magazine is for sale here tonight. You could purchase individual copies or you can purchase a subscription. Uh, you can get more information on the information table outside. So what does any of this have to do with social justice? A lot. For one, many of the stories on the SDN website feature issues related to social justice. And this is a listing of eight exhibits out of hundreds on the SDN website. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to um, bring up just two of these. Uh, the first one is by photographer Isadora Kosofsky, titled Vinnie and David, Life and Incarceration of a Family. It's about a family in New Mexico where both of the um, children, the boys, spent time in prison. This project is about immigrants to the U.S. and contributions they've made to the U.S. in fields of medicine and arts, science, business, education, teaching. And Black Lives Matter in the U.K. by a British photographer, Janine Wydell. So this is just representative of hundreds of exhibits on the SDN website that you can search for and look at. Another point I want to emphasize is the role of documentary photography in the movement for social justice beyond just the photographs. While documentary photographers are driven by the importance of the cause they're engaged in, often their stories will not find their way into mainstream media because these stories are not what sells newspapers and magazines. My point is not to criticize the media because it needs our support today more than ever. But traditional media has limitations on what and how much it can show of stories about social justice. On the other hand, a place like the SDN website has no restrictions. Our only criteria is that the work is legitimate documentary and has a baseline level of quality. Once any of the above stories are on the SDN website, the photographer, the subjects of the photographs, and, and other organizations involved in the same issues can then use these stories to advocate for their cause. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they could take these images and use them um, without proper license, but they could refer to these websites or they can contact the photographers if, if they want to use the image for other purposes. And it's not just about the images that we're talking about. Documentary is as much about meaningful text as it is about the images. Most documentary photographers also research the issues in depth and write information that is not necessarily available elsewhere. And often the photo projects will be part of a larger advocacy campaign. One case in point is the work by Ed Kashi, a, a very well-known documentary photographer and photojournalist. This is his exhibit on the SDN website that focuses on chronic kidney disease of unknown origin, a disease most prevalent among sugarcane workers in Latin America and particularly in Nicaragua. This is not a popular or sexy topic, but Ed is driven to tell this story and to research about it, to write about it. And his work has also been shown in major media around the US as well um, because because of Ed's uh, stature as a photojournalist, he, he gets um, his work seen in places that a lot of people, other people may not be able to. Another photographer is Ruddy Roy, who has a quarter of a million Instagram followers. All of his work is about the experiences of African Americans and people of color. We like to think that Instagram is all about images, but Ruddy posts incredibly long text to accompany his images, and people actually read them. This is actually the text from the previous Instagram posting. Um, and almost all of Ruddy's posts have about um, equivalent amount of text. And people really read these texts. So we like to think that Instagram and social media um, is all about just images. But people actually do read this, this material. This is another one of his images from his Instagram feed. Both Ed Kashi and Ruddy Roy and thousands of other photographers, both on SDN and not on SDN, has used their, their images to bring awareness to issues such as these and to raise funds for research, direct assistance, and advocacy. 
Today, hundreds of millions of photographs are posted to social media each day. These are numbers that are really too hard to comprehend. With such a fire hose of photographs coming at, each, coming at us each second, it becomes difficult to recognize the wheat from the chaff, to recognize the photographs that really matter. If there's a parting word here, it is that some of these photographs really do matter. Some of the photographs, some of the photographers give a tremendous amount of thought as to what they are doing. They bring remarkable skills and talent to their work and, most important, they see their work as part of a larger struggle for social justice and cultural awareness. It is this work that we want to bring to your attention with the Social Documentary Network and with Zeke Magazine. And I look forward to hearing shortly from two such photographers here with us tonight. Thank you. So if you've been to the places and you know the people, the photographs speak even more powerfully. Glenn's photos of Bosnia and Kosovo brought me back 22 years when I first went to Bosnia just after the war. And then I went to Kosovo for many years as well. So um, this year I'm back there working again. It's 22 years since I first went. And I was working then with the generation of people who were the direct victims and perpetrators of the violence. And now I'm working with their children who were 25 years old and saying, why do we still hate each other? So it's a reminder that what gets set into motion, which is also set into motion in our own country, is very hard to recover from. And the next generation carries it and takes it, takes it with them into their lives, creating disruption. So this is what photojournalism can do for us to remind us about all of this. So from a studio in Boston and from endless travels around the world globally, Lou Jones turns out photos for a worldwide audience and some of the most esteemed national publications, international publications too, including Time and Life, National Geographic, and Paris Match. He has a current project to photograph in all the countries of Africa, which is wonderful and challenging and probably has to live to be 120 to get it all done, but it's certainly worth trying. Given the scope of an entire continent, there are 54 countries, 1.2 billion people, and 11.73 million miles. Good luck. <laughs> it's going to be quite a journey. Um, I don't know how he can even imagine doing this, but he's setting out to redefine the modern image of Africa. And he says on his website, our mission is to create a contemporary visual portrait of modern Africa. I've been to maybe a dozen or 15 or so African countries, and it's absolutely true that the world has a very distorted image of Africa and Africans, and knows way too little about the vitality and the beauty of Africa and the resilience of its residents. So Lou is gonna bring us that over this lifetime with all 54 countries. Thank you, Lou, for taking the time to be with us and welcome to this forum. Uh, this is amazing. I haven't been in Northampton in many, many, many years, and I really appreciate Glenn Ruga and uh, the center here for giving me a captive audience. Um, I'm going to do this a little, I think, a little differently than, than uh, Glenn and Maddie. Um, Glenn asked me to put a couple of my projects. I've been doing sort of social documentary for many, many... Actually, I've been doing this for longer than most of you have been alive. Um, and that's true, so don't, don't challenge me. I'm gonna, I'll embarrass you. Um, anyway, uh, we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna do this differently, and I'm gonna try to use just two projects I've done in all these years as examples and metaphor for the greater issue that Glenn wonderfully gave me the platform to talk about. So. We're gonna, so to start with, uh, to talk about, actually I'm gonna talk about interior first. Um, 
photography, photojournalism, social documentary can be sort of divided into two large categories. One is sort of inside, one sort of outside. And I'm going to talk about the internal, the, uh, uh, no, I'm going to talk first about the internal, which is people will talk about their selves, their own experiences. Uh, it could be an immigrant coming and how difficult it is to assimilate. Uh, it could be talking about uh, 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 being abused as a child. Uh, it could be talking about being an African American in times when uh, this was not, you know, even today, but wasn't really a good thing, and how that affected their their lives, or somebody who might be gay, and and how they've had difficulties um, in the world. So that's sort of eternal, and that's a very important thing. And photography has been in the last many years, several years, been used as a vehicle for showing people that. I'm going to talk about the external. Uh, a lot of what happens in Glenn's magazine and Maddie's world in which I'm, nobody cares about me. I'm going to talk, I'm looking to talk about issues that are other things. Glenn has already approached one of the major things. We're, we're looking at newspapers, magazines, TV, uh, even the internet now and how they have to sell advertising. That's what they're, in order to exist, they have. So they are only going to deal with certain issues. Some of them become popular and get clearly, but many of them never get shown. And so my whole career has been trying to deal with a lot of those issues that we have wonderful photographers who have taken it on themselves to, uh, uh, to deal with these issues, sometimes with their own, under their own uh, machinations, their own monies. This is, an issue, this is a project we did a few years ago on the death penalty. We photographed uh, 27 people in 14 death rows around the United States. So this, this gentleman is in Texas. Um, Texas kills more people in this county, this county, than all of the people executed in the rest of the country annually. So, and this was not the first place. We went to many states. But getting into to Texas was really, and so this fellow has been executed. And um, we did incredible interviews. So newspapers, magazines, these kinds of issues, the way we're dealing with them, are often very unpopular. Somebody told me this, and a, a publisher, when I tried to introduce, said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to publish that. Our, our advertisers would hate this. And so you have to, we have to find new vehicles, Glenn being one of them in his magazine, who's going to show this kind of work. Um, to be, bring it a little bit more personally, this is a woman in Kentucky on death row. Um, she was convicted of killing six people in a spree over about 24 to 48 hours. And we photographed her in Kentucky, as I said. And the whole thing started in this kind of thing was years ago, I did another project years ago that ended up hanging on the wall and people would literally go right up to the picture almost putting their nose to the glass and looking at the photographs and then looking at the captions and back to the, and I realized this ability for photography to compel people. So I said, maybe I can turn that engagement into something different, into something more compelling. 
i.e. the death penalty. Um, we're going to go quickly. There are only a few. He, this is a, a, a prison in, in uh, California. And I, was, I did the book. I did two books. And then they hired me, someone hired me to do one in California. So we have to make a living doing this. And it's very, very complicated to, to do that. But someone saw the book, hired me to do that, this kind of thing. I got an award for the, this death penalty work a few years ago. And, but to bring this a little closer, some, the MC told me a quote that Robert Kennedy very famous quote, speech that he did years ago about how artists are the conscience of a community, the conscience of a, of a country. The newspapers often are compelled to deal with issues in one way, but artists can go off. And so as photographers, this becomes really, really a, a tremendous responsibility. This current project that we're doing, amongst others, is Pan-Africa Project. You go online, you can see anybody that's interested. We're trying to photograph, thank you <laughs> for the advertisement, the 54 countries in Africa. Uh, I noticed that years ago, I noticed that Western media does not deal with the issue of Africa, does not deal with news. It's actually, to be very political, a form of neo-colonialism where they only publish stories about pestilence, poverty, and conflict about Africa. And this is a way of controlling that 1.2 billion people that you claimed. So we have tried to use photography this is in Morocco. We're trying to use to show the modern Africa, not that cartoon that our schools often of Tarzan and Jane, but a modern, very, I love the word vitality that you use. Oh, that's, can I use that? Wonderful, wonderful vitality that I'm seeing there. This is Morocco, and uh, this is someone making a living. And this is, so we're trying to do industry and culture and music and sports and, uh, education, medicine. This is Tanzania. And um, we... I realized, once I started this a few years ago, that photography is the universal language. We don't need Rosetta Stone to understand these pictures so we can see. So the internet, all of these things are amazing. So I had the power to start to go. And when I do this with social media and things, I can show people, I can show people as I travel. So this is Tanzania. Uh, we communicate. This is a place, Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso is right there. All right, so I'm going and I'm trying to find using social media and making this compelling compendium so that people, educators, were dealing with curriculum. This is a photograph. This is probably one of the first ones I took. I was walking in Senegal. I was walking down the street, saw a bunch of boys, men, fighting, drinking beer and fighting. I walked past it, it was not worth. I turned around, came back, and said, this is my career. I have to deal with this issue. So I asked them, without using language, if I could take their picture. And I realized that this was a moment, a seminal moment in my career where I was realizing that fear is one of the most compelling negative things that we can do in terms of creation and dealing with these stories. Overcoming that is a photographers have to be there. Other art forms. Herman Melville did Moby Dick without setting foot on a ship. 
Photographers, if we want to do polar bears, we're going to be cold. <laughs> if we want to be do war, we're going to be scared. But these are the kinds of progress, these photographs. This is a newspaper in Namibia, Namibia, right here. So, it's, so we're going country, and we spend a serious amount of time trying to get people to see these places in different. We're doing sort of anti-photojournalism, where we're looking at the progressive things rather than the negative things that end up on the front page of the newspapers and get the Pulitzer Prizes. So we're actually turning, after many years, this in a different direction. This is uh, Burkina Faso also. This is a dance troupe. And in order to talk about these issues, we have to go deeply into the culture, and arts are one of them. So again, we're looking, it's not positive because we're, these things really exist, but we're ignoring them in our press. And so as a photographer, this is social documentary to me. That we're turning the camera on issues that are really important that people ignore. We talk about it as we're telling stories about people to two people that think they already know the stories. One of the things that we've discovered is how this contemporary Africa is moving along. People with coats and ties, going into tall buildings, carrying briefcases, talking on cell phones, doing business, curing diseases, um, do, uh, and uh, inventing things, making music, all of those things. But in point of fact, there are two contemporary Africas. One is this cultural and in this country we think of these people as being I'm going to use a terrible word primitive poor uneducated and we think whoa that's they would be us if they had resources in point of fact no they are preserving these ways of life so this kind of thing goes on and is really being, being nurtured by certain populations. So it's very different. So showing Africa in the parallel between the two worlds is really, really a big part. We're doing industry. This is, this is, uh, this is Zambia. This was uh, December. And this is copper mining. So there some of the, most of the copper in the world is coming out of Africa. Gold, diamonds, oil, et cetera, et cetera. That's where we're getting, we're getting all of this stuff from Africa and we don't know that. This is architecture, very traditional, amazing. This is, uh, um, and this is in Western Africa, Sahel architecture. And this is what Africa looks like today. This is uh, Casablanca. Yes, Casablanca. Anybody been there? Anyway, Morocco. And this is, so thank you very much. This is remarkable, and we have one more. We have Mathilde Simas, who um, uses her gifts as a photographer to create awareness of human trafficking. To create awareness of human trafficking, one of the great tragedies of our society, and to make us know more about all forms of human rights violations as she writes on her website, to illuminate the enduring strength of victims, survivors, and people impacted by trauma. 
In 2017, she founded <clears throat> Capture Humanity to document groups that assist women, children, marginalized communities, and conservation efforts, all really critical. This is astounding work, and again, brave and courageous work, and as Lou said, often dangerous work that captures people in action, reminding us that one woman's dedication and one photo that captures exploitation can be the start of protest against that exploitation, against that servitude, against that captured person, and help us create freedom for the victims. This is profoundly worthwhile and uplifting work. Very few people have the courage to do it. Three of them are with us tonight. Let's welcome Mathilde. Hello, thank you for having me. So I am a humanitarian photographer, and um, my work really focuses on human rights. Um, the photography I create really aims to advocate for and alongside survivors of human trafficking by really amplifying their voices. Um, my work really acts to engage the community in, um, in just raising public awareness about these issues that I document. Uh, the photography I create really aims to do three things, and the first is to inform people. I want people to really um, see m the photographs that I create, and I want them to create awareness about the social issues that I'm documenting. And the second thing is I want my photos to um, pro provoke discussions uh, about these social issues. I want people to feel so connected to the photography that I'm creating that they want to learn more about the social issues that I'm documenting. And three, I want to inspire action with these images. I want people to feel so compelled and so drawn to the emotion that they feel from the images that they don't just want to learn more and share what they've learned with their friends and their family, but they want to uh, donate their time uh, to the organizations that I document. And so the work I do is really done by uh, fostering partnerships with organizations uh, that not only help me understand these social issues that I document, um, but they also introduce me to the survivors that I collaborate with and I create these um, portraits with. And so there are two projects I'm going to uh, show tonight. Uh, one is um, uh, Faces Behind Atrocity. It's a portrait series on human trafficking, and it was created in partnership with an organization named Heart Kenya. And the second one is um, Growing Up Female in, Ma in Maasai Society, and it's a project on female genital mutilation. So the work I do on human trafficking is part of a really long-term documentary project which seeks to inform people about human trafficking and its different forms. And so um, the project uh, not only documents uh, on a local level, but also a global level. Uh, the reason why I've chosen to uh, work on this theme is really because it's such a big issue and I feel like people really, um, they really don't understand what human trafficking is. And in order to stop human trafficking, uh, we really need to understand what it is. The problem of human trafficking is still very much misunderstood. Um, currently, the International Labor Organization estimates, estimates that there are over 40 million people that are victimized by human trafficking worldwide. And it's now become the second highest uh, illegal trade in the world. Um, it also targets uh, vulnerable populations, primarily women and girls. Um, so the work on human trafficking that I've uh, created up to date um, has explored uh, organ trafficking of persons with albinism in Tanzania. This is a young woman named Pendo. She uh, lost her arm in a superstitious uh, attack. Um, and this um, photograph was supported by an organization named Under the Same Sun. Um, it also explores human trafficking um, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, this is a young woman named Carrie Stewart. She's from Maine. So um, this is a body of work that really explores um, sex trafficking in the United States. And uh, the project also explores this topic in uh, New York City. 
Um, and uh, this is a portrait that was done on a young woman uh, through a partnership with an organization in the Philippines named um, Voice of the Free. It's um, uh, about uh, cyber sex trafficking. And now this brings me to the Faces Behind Atrocity series. Um, it's a portrait series uh, that really creates awareness about forced marriage, uh, forced uh, child labor, and sex trafficking in Kenya. And again, it was created in partnership with this organization named Heart Kenya. Um, the portrait series is of seven young women. Uh, they're between the ages of 13 and 16 years old. They're from four different nationalities, and they all come from different trafficking experiences. Each of them was rescued from the trafficking world and are all in the heal healing process. The survivors were photographed wearing colorful uh, carnival masks, which is a very sharp contrast between their pain and um, the joy of a party like carnival. The use of masks really came about as a way to conceal their identities. And so the fear is, um, you know, the challenge is to conceal who, who they are because of the fear of their perpetrators finding them and also the stigma that follows survivors of human trafficking. So this, uh, this project had a really positive outcome. As you can only imagine, survivors of human trafficking, they have a very low self-esteem, but by creating images um, that portray them as beautiful, and brave, they're able to see themselves in a completely new light. They're really able to see their potential. And further, um, if, when, they, when they see their images um, shown in public places and they see the impact that their images are having, they feel really empowered and, and courageous. So up until this point, um, I've spent probably a year working on the logistics with Heart Kenya about the project, uh, talking about my creative ideas, uh, really trying to um, identify the subjects that want to participate in a campaign like this, um, and really um, talking even to the survivors at this point about what are their creative ideas, because this is a collaboration with the survivors. It's not just about my ideas. Um, and so uh, the big part of this is to work with the survivors and give them a choice as to how they want to be photographed to empower them. And so, so now I've traveled to Kenya. I've been there for about three weeks. Um, I have uh, really dug, dug deep into this issue, really learning through the organization what this problem looks like in their country. And now I've photographed the girls. I've listened to their stories. I've gotten to know each of them. Uh, very well, and now I've come back to the United States and I have these really beautiful pictures. So what do I do with them? How do I inform people about this problem? How do I create awareness? How do I uh, promote discussions? So for the past two years, I've been using every possible outlet possible. Uh, I created a short documentary film. I've appeared on the Brazilian news channel. I've appeared on our local channel. Uh, as part of a social documentary network uh, feature uh, with um, Anthony Everett about the power of photography and social change. I've used numerous, uh, numerous, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I've written numerous um, proposals and um, pitches to online publications and magazines hoping that they'll write an article about the work. So I've actually, um, my, my reach has been pretty broad, um, but you know, there's no magic formula. People ask me all the time, how, do you, how are you getting your work out there? They're always so compelled by how I'm getting this information out there. And so again, there's no magic formula. It's tireless. You do, I do it all, almost once a week, I'm setting out, sending out a, p a pitch or a proposal, asking an art space to show the work. <coughs> And so um, this brings me to my second project, um, the Growing Up Female and Messiah Society. Um, it's a project that really explores the challenges of being female in a society that represses the voices of Maasai girls, particularly on this issue of female genital mutilation 
It's also um, referred to as a female circumcision. In the Maasai uh, culture, it's, um, it's called the female rite of passage. And if you've never heard about uh, the female rite of passage, it's a ceremony that's performed that brings um, the girl from, adult, uh, from a child, from being a girl into adulthood to being a woman. And that's when she's ready to, for marriage. And so the series documents an unlawful uh, female circumcision uh, ceremony. These are the warriors uh, getting ready for the ceremony. And it also um, focuses on portraits of um, men, uh, young girls, and women that I uh, interviewed in order to really try to understand this issue. So these are the women, they're praying over a tree branch before the young girl goes into the hut to be um, circumcised. So the project really aims to increase awareness about the health risks involved in this practice. And it also, um, I hope, is to spread awareness about the psychological trauma that this practice puts these young women through. Uh, this is an image of the young girl in the tent with her mother. Uh, she's drinking cow blood to strengthen her uh, before the circumcision. This is the woman who's going to perform the circumcision. Uh, this is a young girl who is married to this gentleman. Um, I spoke to her at length about her uh, thoughts and ideas of uh, female circumcision. And all the girls basically voice the same thing. Um, they say that they have no choice. Uh, they will be become stigmatized from their communities. They're, even their parents are not allowed to speak to them if they don't go through the right. Uh, they're basically cast into the wilderness. Uh, these are some of the gentlemen of this community. Um, the gentleman on this side is the tribal elder. The gentleman in the middle is his son. And the two gentlemen off to the other side are just um, husbands of some of the girls that I was uh, privileged to speak to. So how has this body of work been used? So currently, it's on a world tour um, to, uh, again, spread awareness about this, um, this practice. Uh, the tour is called State of the World. It started in Paris, it's currently in Taipei, and it will be traveling to Japan with other um, locations to be announced. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited to be able to have these images reach such a wide global audience with this message. So my goal is to create compelling images of brave survivors by not only showcasing the organizations that help assist me to, um, to capture these, uh, these subjects, but it's also to really capture the deep emotion that each of these individuals um, has. Uh, my hope is that my photography will inform and provoke discussions about human trafficking and female genital mutilation, and also um, inspire action to create positive change. One of the most important things about advocacy photography is to raise questions and to leave the audience with something to think about later. My hope is that there are a lot of questions about this body of work that a lot of people will go out and want to learn more about and that it's these small questions that sometimes are the starting point of really uh, starting tangible change on these social issues. Thank you very much. I've worked on this issue of female genital mutilation. I know how difficult it is and what happens to girls who refuse. It's almost impossible and breaks people's hearts. But I had a graduate student from Kenya who spent a couple of years in Vermont with me when I was teaching at the School for International Training. And um, she was an older woman, probably in her 40s or 50s at the time, and she wanted to think about how we had rites of passage in the US without having genital mutilation. And she went back to Kenya and opened a center to encourage women to have the rite of passage and do the entire week worth of ritual and not cut the daughters. 
and she's trying to spread that around Kenya now. So it was another, another result of cross-fertilization. So by way of wrapping up, I want to make just a few comments connecting the three presentations, and then we're going to have a, a very good discussion with Q&A. Um, you three are making the visible, invisible visible. And one of the things I've learned about people is that we need to be seen and we need to be heard. And most people in the places that you've gone, whether it's the Maasai in Kenya or the death row in a US prison, are invisible to us. And to turn that around so that we develop compassion and empathy and care for people who are otherwise not seen is, is pretty remarkable. And bringing dignity to those who suffer from lack of dignity. Helping people who are photographed to feel their worth, to feel the importance of their issues and their concerns, and helping to fire up our own conscience and the conscience of all those who see the photos with a deep hope that we will take on these causes and perhaps that will happen here tonight as well. So I'd like to bring up the three panelists. Sit down, please. Lou, Mathilde. Happy to launch it off with the first question, and I have, I have one I'd like to ask our panelists. So I've been working um, on a bridging project between people from Western Massachusetts, a little town called Leverett in Western Massachusetts, and people from a county in the coal fields of Eastern Kentucky. And we've been doing, bridging the divides, dialogues. They've been here, we've been there, we've exchanged a lot. And I learned that they were very agitated by the war on poverty in the 1960s when photographers planted themselves in Eastern Kentucky. And according to our participants or their parents, um, the photographers took the images of the dirtiest kid the most rundown house, um, the most impoverished, falling apart school, um, the most damaged car, and they felt that their dignity was stripped from them by the photographic images to the point where they are so sensitive to photographers that they didn't want us to ever take any pictures when we went down there. We were so careful we pointed our cameras. Actually, somebody was shot. One person was actually shot and killed. And they made a movie about that, which is available, which I can get for you, about a photographer from Canada who was killed because he was taking, they just couldn't stand one more image of one more tumble down house being taken. So I want to ask you how you think about and how you deal with that as photographers. How do you help people keep their dignity when you're showing the negative sides of their lives? That, that's an excellent question, and the example that you uh, speak to is a known example, particularly in Appalachia, how um, that became such a problem. Um, and I, th I think it's something that every photographer needs to deal with when they photograph people. But, but it's all about dignity, approaching people with dignity and respect. And the subjects understand that. I mean, if you drive into Appalachia in your Porsche and spend four hours photographing and then, and then leave, you know, people understand that's different than a photographer who will spend weeks, months, or years coming back and photographing the community and getting to know the community. Um, so I, I think a, a lot of it just has to do with the intention and, and the practice of, of the photographer, but the best work is always done with complete respect for the subject. Anybody else the same thing? Sure. Um, so for me, it's really about building relationships. Um, and again, a partnering with organizations uh, that introduce me to the subjects that I uh, photograph. It's about really digging deeper and spending the time that you need to really get to know uh, the people that you photograph to make sure that they understand that you're not there to exploit them. You're really there to tell their story and empower them. Uh, I think that um, a lot of the issue that you bring up is, un a lot of it is, un what, there's a word that they taught me recently, unintended consequences. Has anybody heard that one? And so, um, uh, although you have to understand that the, 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 the Pan-Africa Project is almost a reaction against that exact situation where 
people go to Africa to win Pulitzer Prizes. So they're looking for negative things. They're looking, you know, you know, the classic picture of the black kid through chain link fence with flies on his face, you know, and that'll win awards. So that was our reaction to that. There's a wonderful story about uh, W. Gene Smith, who did the, um, the issue in Spain, the story in Spain. Do anybody remember the name, name of the town? There was a wonderful Life magazine photographer named W. Gene Smith who With the was spinners, a, the wool spinners? Uh, yes, there yeah. were, but yeah, yeah. It was, he was a god. Uh, w. Gene Smith was a god in photojournalism. And he did this black and white story, went to this town, made it famous, it was a cover story. And 20 years later, somebody went back to the town and they hated that story. It just, people, tourists came from all over the world to, to gawk at these people who were just so primitive and so, so quaint and so weird. So um, we have to be very, very careful and, and re react to it. In the Death Row Project, I got into real trouble once with um, lecturing after I did a lot of the project. They brought me to a school and I, and I, I said that you, we always have to remember that in projects like this, we are exploiting these people. The teacher went nuts. But as a photographer, we have to understand that um, very often these unintended consequences are a major component of how it changes the lives of, of, uh, of people. But, uh, as Glenn said, we try to do the best we can. Yes. People just want to come up to the microphone here yes. and ask a question. Must be. You seem to have a question here. Sure. <laughs> Speak loud. Speak loud. Yes. 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 People can't hear me. What's that? Go. Well, I just wonder about um, just how it works with your with your website. Um, you mentioned that people can see the images and you know license them properly for use. I just wonder how the photographers can finance these projects or or make a living or um, sort of that aspect of it. Excellent, excellent question. Um, let me just c correct maybe a misunderstanding. P people cannot license work directly from the social documentary website. If they want to license the work, they'd have to contact the photographer and ma make separate arrangements. But how do people finance this work? Um, much of the documentary work, th there is very little commercial value for. And there are many people who do amazing documentary photography work who are dentists, who are school teachers, who are other things and are committed to doing this form. Um, and this is what they really love to do and, and they find time and resources to do it. Other people, I mean, I think Lou Jones is a great example, has a thriving commercial photography business, which is, um, I mean, how he can fund the Pan-Africa project, but I, I should allow him to talk about this. But th there are a lot of ways um, to fund it. Uh, grants, they're hard to come by, people do get grants. Um, but any way you can is really the answer. I think that um, hopefully there's some students here. You know, I've talked about this often. Um, I do have a, a commercial business which is paid for, paid for the death row project. But in point of fact, we have, and this is something that uh, should be really important, I think, to students or people who are trying to do this, is that. Um, the modern technical social media has changed the nature of all of this a lot. Not only can we disseminate, I literally can take people on these trips with me and, and, and show them work, show them the, show them the continent, show them the country constantly. But we have used social media and we use a thing called crowdfunding. Does anybody know what that is? Okay. Um, they brought me over to lecture in Africa about this because it's not as popular a thing, but um, we, have, we have funded this last three or four projects using Kickstarter. We've done two successful Kickstarter and raised 
quite a bit of money. So, um, we, you know, we talk about, oh, isn't it terrible that uh, email and, and uh, Facebook and all this? Well, it, it, this, these social medias have extended my career by years. Being able to engage with people halfway around the world. I said universal language. They're seeing the photographs, but they're also people. We got money from people we've never met from halfway around the world that, who were engaged by Africa and the things we were doing. So um, you talk about funding, and uh, we've used, we've used uh, uh, crowdfunding and social media to advantage and, and paid for all of that, a lot of it. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I, I have a different question. I was, I was thinking about, you talked about forming a relationship with your subjects and respecting their dignity. And then I'm thinking about the technical aspect because obviously you just didn't race in with your iPhone and go click and leave. How do you kind of broker between forming a relationship and then bringing the lights and everything and and you know your Matilda your photos were just beautiful thank you but but i i can only imagine you really had to really take some time with those women um, with the masks especially because i you, yeah so like i mentioned this was a year in planning yeah okay um, some people think it's easier to tell these stories through portraits, but it's really not, especially when you're working with um, a population of people that are heavily traumatized. So I heavily rely on the organization that I'm partnering with. Uh, normally they have a psychologist on staff. Uh, sometimes even I need to talk to the psychologist. Uh, we need to think about our wellness as well. Uh, I'm always constantly worried about if I'm triggering my subject. Um, so it's really about um, spending that time that really needs to, you, know, you really need. It's not just uh, with the organization, it's with the subject themselves. Uh, so for that particular project, I spent three weeks with these uh, seven young ladies. Um, I traveled with some of them to remote areas of Kenya, photographing outreach projects even. And this was just a really super uh, amazing organization that was really organized, a lot of really intelligent people who really care about these young girls. So again, uh, that's how I'm able to form these relationships. Uh, the Carrie Stewart project of the young woman that I've been photographing in Maine, I've been working with her for about a year and a half now. Our first meeting was a four hour meeting, uh, having coffee, talking about her. You know, so some of the meetings that we have together, it's not me taking her photograph or sitting in her living room waiting for something to happen, it's us over coffee. Um, and so that part of the work I'm doing is really, really important. And it's always when I do share an image or a story of a survivor, I have to ask their permission. Um, when I write about them, I have to send them the writing to make sure they're okay because again, I don't want to trigger a survivor ever. And sometimes, like I did a news feature uh, for the Brazilian newscast um, where I brought a survivor with me who felt really ready and she wasn't going to be even fully identified but she was triggered after the fact and so some of the interview had to be taken down. So it's, it's, it's very sensitive, um, you just have to be very caring and again, it's about empowering the survivor. Even if the artwork is awful, the pictures are awful, it's not just about that, it's about what it does for the survivor. You know, it's making them not just feel seen, but it's acknowledging that their story is important and sharing it, it has a very um, important social aspect to it, to share these stories and for all of us to make them feel heard. Thank you for your question, yeah. Can I just make one quick follow up? Sure. Because um, it seems to me that once you develop a trusting relationship, you're able to kind of collaborate on telling their story. Yes, absolutely. And, and that you're serving them in a way because, oh, yeah. you know, when you look at the literature of how to help people cope and overcome trauma, telling your story and feeling it validated and heard is super, super important. 
Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, and I, also I see the intersection with psychology. In this yeah, I, mean, I actually studied psychology undergrad, yeah. so it helps me a lot. And I also studied women's studies undergrad. Uh -huh. um, but I also talk about a lot, the, the first body of work with the young girls with the masks as a, um, a healing project. Yeah. It's healing through art. It's a collaboration with a survivor where I'm giving them as much power to control not just their narrative, but their image. And so that it, it's incredibly powerful to be able to take control of your own narrative and have someone assist you through that. Thank you. I got Gary over here and you're next. Uh, Glenn spoke, I thought, real effectively about the importance of text. I wish the other two of you could each speak a little bit about how important the text you put with these pictures are. Uh, what pictures don't need a text, if any don't need a text, or do they all need a good deal of text? Are they worth and need the thousand words? I, I <laughs> part of the, my thing I left out was the tyranny of words um, that we speak about, you know. Um, uh, as I said, you know, being there is a, a very major component to um, the photography that's very different from other art forms, you know, there's, um, but yes, text, the way we accept text in this country is important, you know, the, the newspapers and magazines require, and I have, I had to learn, uh, it's a horrible thing, to write, <laughs> you know, so I don't sleep anymore, I don't, I don't literally, I don't do not sleep because I write from about 10 o'clock to maybe three, four, five o'clock in the morning that goes along with these books and, and, and we're doing a book on Pan-Africa right now where the captions and things like that. I try to keep it very brief and, uh, but because I, you know, of course I want the photographs to speak for themselves, but um, there is a extraordinary, we are sending out articles to uh, newspapers and magazines in Africa about the issue of photographs we're taking and it requires a substantial amount of text to, to go along with the articles, yeah. I'm very inspired and impressed with the three of you and uh, you've really moved all of us. I have the question about the project in Kenya. You mentioned about the women and their dignity and keeping that integral. Have you thought about making a, a short video or a film that they could see and, and pass amongst themselves and, um, you know, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole concept. Um, sure. So the, um, the Faces Behind Atrocity series, I actually did work on a short documentary film. Uh, and so if you can actually view it on my website under videos, um, it's a 13 minute film. It's very compelling. Um, and it talks a lot about the organization, what they do and uh, about the problem of human trafficking. So film is definitely something that I've been a part of, I'm learning more of. I think film is very important and so is the writing. I'm very fortunate that I, um, about three years ago, I started this a, a group called Capture Humanity and it was really born out of the necessity to have a good writer. I work with a writer, her name is Jessica Barrett. She's part of my team. She's been volunteering for me for about two years. Most of the work I do with human trafficking organizations is voluntary. A lot of these organizations are very grassroots. They can't afford uh, photography, and photography is so important in terms of not just telling their story, but for their annual reporting and their websites. But back to your question about film, uh, yes, film is very important. And uh, if you go to my website, um, I'd love it for you to, um, to view the film. Thank you so much. Okay, who's next? Oh, I see lots of hands. <laughs> Hi, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm a sophomore at Amherst College, so I'm currently <laughs> trying to figure out how to start this process of becoming a photojournalist. And I was wondering if you could all kind of speak to your first experiences, particularly going abroad, um, how you would get, I know you talked a little bit about getting funding and crowdsourcing, um, but kind of how you all started that process because I'm finding it a little bit difficult to make the first step. Yeah, I, I mean, for, for, for one, I, I don't think any of us here are traditional photojournalists. Um, 
I, I'm not. I, I came up through the documentary world. And for me, the difference is that photojournalism means that a media company is paying somebody to go out into the world and photograph something. Nobody was paying me to go to Bosnia to do this work. Um, but, but I do know a lot about the field because I interact with a lot of photojournalists. And one thing I know for sure is that being on the ground overseas is a much better place to be than sitting here in the US trying to get a job overseas as a photojournalist. If you could establish a presence and an expertise in a certain part of the world, um, your options of finding work either in that part of the world or with um, Western media companies are infinitely greater once you're there and are, have demonstrated that you can do the work and, and know your way around. Either of you like yeah, to I would agree, Glenn. It's about having that experience and putting yourself out there in the field. I'm the most happiest is when I'm out in the field. Um, but it, yeah, it's about establishing yourself with organizations and just, um, again, putting out these proposals uh, to organizations that you might want to work with. That would, that's the way I do it. And also, um, interning is a good way to get your feet wet in, in, um, as a photojournalist. Hi, I'm a second year at Bard at the Care Center, and I was just wondering what inspired you guys to do your projects for social justice, like the death row um, and the human trafficking and the Bosnia one? Like what inspired you to do those projects? Was there something that inspired you for the human trafficking or the death row or the Bosnia one? Well, um, inspiration comes from, I think, a lot of, uh, of, of varied things. I had an argument with my father when I was, the best I can calculate it was I was around 14 years old over the death penalty. And, um, and so it stuck with me until I was in my 20s, you know. So, um, and as you do commercial work, as you do photojournalism, as you do those kinds of projects, um, you, you, you start to realize that you have this tool. It wasn't until very recently that I realized that it was a universal language. It was just this tool that I could tell stories, you know. I'm, dyslexic and words or, you know, I talked about the tyranny of words, so I'm using photographs, I'm using pictures, I'm using images that people respond. But the inspirations come from, and then my mother called me a contrarian. Um, and I always really resisted that. I didn't think that I was difficult. Um, so, but, and so, Having been in this business for so long, I started to look for those kinds of things. Let me back up. Somebody gave me the phrase, how does the phrase go, um, uh, of, of living your life in, you know, with, with, with your art, you know. Um, he actually said, designing your life. And so that's what I've primarily done, designed my life to photograph those things that I'm interested in and those f things that I'm interested in I go after and you know, so they, they go in both directions. And the inspiration can come. So they're all, they've all been things I've been excruciatingly interested in. And then I say, oh, I've got this tool and I can turn it on to something. The rest of it becomes very complicated. You know, how you get to travel. Somebody asked about traveling and things like that. Learning how to travel and take pictures is really, really hard to do. Well, let me just respond. I, I just want to respond to the Bosnia work because it's an interesting story. Um, I, I didn't get involved in Bosnia through photography at all. I had pretty much given up photography by that time. I was um, had a graphic design business here in the Valley and um, wasn't really putting much attention into photography at the time. But then when the war started in Bosnia, for, for a lot of reasons, I became very, very compelled to 
do something about it and, and got very involved and photography was completely secondary. And eventually I found myself in Bosnia with a camera with me and I realized that it was an amazing story to tell um, and I, I had an amazing opportunity to um, take these images. And once I started doing it, I realized that I, I had a propensity to do this work that, that I missed and got back into it. But, but the point is that it was really the issue that drove me. It wasn't to be a photographer. It was really the issue of um, what was happening in the region. Thank you. Um, how do you mitigate the risk of confirmation bias when you're crafting narrative? Can you repeat that question, please? Um, when you're crafting narrative and you're documenting different people, especially from cultures that are so different than your own, how do you mitigate the risk of introducing confirmation bias from what narratives that might, you know, I don't know, looking at like Africa, for instance, and, you know, the predominant narratives we have here and how different it is from what's actually happening there. How do you go into a story while mitigating confirmation bias that you might have existing going in? I have a, a story uh, that I've told uh, once or twice before about I was in Burkina Faso and I was photographing, and this is a Jeopardy question, in the capital, which is Ouagadougou. And uh, it's uh, uh, an amazing place. And so I had photographed, I've been there for several days photographing. Now this is, uh, by the time we got to Burkina Faso, we had done several countries. So we're dealing with that issue constantly. It's really a big, but we got there and I was photo and I was there for so, several days. And so I went to m someone and I said, uh, we've been in Ouagadougou, we need to go somewhere else. We need to photograph some some other place that is really as compelling as what you know and he said so they said you've got to go to Bobo and I was like Bobo and it turns out you know they everything is shortened there Wagadugu is not Wagadugu it's Waga and Bobo du Lasso is the name of it so we I said well oh how where is oh yes we've got to, it's the cultural capital and I said oh we've got to go there I said um, how far is it? Now my degrees were in, in physics, so my Einsteinian uh, attitude about distance and time, they said, oh, about six hours. I was looking, looking at about 500 miles, but they said six hours, so that was the moment. And then I said, well, which way? And they went, you just go to Bobo. And I said, no, 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 north, south, east, west. These were college-educated people and had no idea what I was talking about. So I realized again and again and again, but in real time this time, that we're speaking an entirely different language, not only because I'm, we're dealing with English as our common language, but in terms of culture. So your attitude about bias is so excruciatingly important. And so uh, one of the things I do is that I do very, very little uh, access from this part of the world. Almost all my access is done through my conversations and my research while I'm there. I let them tell me their stories and why they're important and, and things like that, and that's what I try to figure out. But you're absolutely right. The project was designed from the very beginning to try to get over some of those hurdles and learn more and more as we go to get rid of some of those barriers. So um, your, your, your point is oh, so important. Thank you. Uh, so for me, with my work on human trafficking, I do have an advisor, human trafficking survivor, that sits as an advisor in my group. And so a lot of the language goes through her and um, I do use personal testimonies in all of the writing that I do. So again, it's the survivor taking control of the story. Uh, with the work on the Maasai, um, again, it's um, reporting on this, the testimonials that all of the people that I'm talking with about the issue. Uh, it's really me reporting about their feelings, their perspectives, and helping me understand really why um, a practice like that is done, but it's really always through their perspective and their testimonials. With the work that I do, um, particularly with Zeke magazine, it's a, it's a very important question. And the way we address that is um, 
recently we've had special issues. Um, the first one was a woman's issue, and the first thing I did was went out and brought in a woman editor. I mean, I, I was the editor of Zeke Magazine, and it wouldn't quite be right if I was gonna be editing this issue, so we brought in a woman editor for that. We did a special issue on Roma and Travelers, and the best decision I made was to find a guest editor from Eastern Europe who was um, of Roma origin himself and worked with me as a guest editor. And we had lots and lots and lots of arguments over pictures about how they were, might be disrespectful and so forth. And then our next uh, issue of Zeke Magazine will be the Africa issue, and we brought in an African um, photographer from Johannesburg to be the guest editor on that. So um, I, I think you can see the three of us struggle with this issue a lot and find ways to address it. And it's an excellent question, thank you. So thank you for that wonderful question and all the wonderful questions. We're going to wrap up now, but there is a reception outside and there are refreshments and our three artists will be here to be able to answer more questions. Before I turn the mic over to Michael, I want you to join me in thanking these elegant participants. <laughs> This is an extremely inspiring presentation. Thanks to all three of you. It's quite wonderful. Thank you, you Paula. Thank yep. you, Michael. Thank you so much for your questions, your insights, and your support here. Really appreciate it. I want to thank Paula, Glenn, Lou, and Mathilde. Uh, it was really, really helpful to have you all here. Um, there is a donation jar uh, somewhere out there if you'd like to contribute to SDN's work. And we have, for those of you that signed in, a record of how to contact you and keep you a part of this photojournalist uh, community. So thank you, and have a wonderful evening. And, and I really want to thank um, Michael, Sarah, and Debbie from the Valley Syrian Relief Committee. It was great to work with them on this project.